Right, good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Simon, for his excellent talk. Um, he ex said that I might address some of his issues. Um, I hadn't actually planned on doing that, but what I plan to do is to talk for about 40, 45 minutes and give you some exercises related <laughs> to materials writing, and then I want to leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end when you can ask me whatever questions you like about materials writing and I'm happy to address some of the points that um, Simon mentioned. Um, so I'm a course book writer. Uh, I've written every type of course book, student book, workbooks, teachers books, uh, a, lot, a whole variety of things. That's about 70% of my time now, 75% is writing, about 15, 20% is teacher training, and then about 5% is teaching, and I do volunteer teaching with refugees in Oxford because I think writers and teacher trainers need to keep one foot in the classroom all the time and just remind themselves what happens. So. Uh, nobody would employ me because my schedule is all over the place, but I can do volunteer teaching and the students are happy to let me pilot my materials with them and in return they get free English lessons, so it seems like a good deal uh, to me. The title of my talk is What No One Ever Tells You About Materials Writing. Uh, I've been doing some work for uh, a Routledge book which comes out next year and I was looking at the issue of how do we train people to write materials and one of my pet peeves, if you like, is that on most training courses teachers aren't taught the basic principles of materials writing. I've been a teacher trainer on CELTAS, CERT TESOLs, diplomas, I've done some work on MA work and so on and we never actually teach people to write materials. If you do an MA course, you may learn to analyze materials, evaluate them, and you do what we call materials development, uh, but it's not the same as materials writing. And on CELTA courses and so on, quite often we don't teach basic principles. We tend to discover it if you speak to most Co uh, materials writers, for example, course book writers, they will say, I was never trained to write materials, I just learnt it on the job. I learnt it by doing, I learnt it by trial and error. And that's very valuable, but I don't understand why we don't just deal with certain principles on training courses and help teachers early on. So, if you're here because you're interested in materials writing, you should get some ideas from me. If you're a teacher trainer, you're more experienced writer, uh, teacher, tra teacher and teacher trainer who's done some work, you might get some ideas on how you can train people um, that you're working with, okay? So you can take it either way. Um, there's lots of things that people never tell you about materials writing. It's a bit of a secret society. How do you get published <coughs> and all of these things? There isn't a formal route. Um, I've picked six or seven items because that's all I have time for. There are more, but I thought we'd kick off with some sort of basic principles and see how we go. Um, what do we mean by materials? It's actually quite a philosophical question. It's sort of um, connected with clothing, and in the same way that you have small, medium and large, we have beginner, intermediate, advanced. And if you pay a bit more money for your clothing, you can get something tailor-made in the same way that you can pay for one-to-one -one and the teacher will design materials. That seems to be the kind of analogy. Um, I used to work on the Trinity Cert TESOL. I, was, uh, I used to be a trainer on it and I also used to inspect the course. And the Cert TESOL, if you're not familiar, is similar to the CELTA. It's an introductory course and one of the tasks that trainees have is they have to present a piece of material that they've used on the course to the kind of examiner, assessor person and they present this piece of material and say whether it worked well or whether it didn't work quite so well. And one time I went along to do the interview with a candidate and he brought in two oranges and I thought is this does this count as material? Anyway, he had all the different things he'd done. He'd taught orange, he'd taught the fruit, he'd taught the colour with this material, 
Uh, he'd also used it for throwing, for getting to know your activities instead of a ball, so it's technically a material. And I once observed another teacher in a class who had oranges and apples and taught students how to categorise arguments for for and against essays by separating apples and oranges and representing arguments. So potentially an orange is a material, but it's not what I'm going to talk about this evening, OK? The type of... When I talk about materials writing, I mean these kinds of things. So it's the stuff we have to sort of write down, put down, either on paper or increasingly that we put online. And often when we talk about materials writers, we think about course book writers and that kind of thing. But this is the stuff that teachers do every day of the week. We all write materials. Let's test my theory that we do this. Can you turn to the person next to you and tell them in the last two weeks in your job, which of these have you written or what other types of materials have you written? Tell the person next to you. What have you written? Stop you there. Were there, did you say any materials that aren't up there? Were there any others that you wrote? Hmm? Yeah, okay, you wrote a lecture, okay, for lecturing your students, yeah, okay. Any others? Oh, yeah, nice note taking stuff, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. New, writing news headlines or adapting them, yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, you just remember that one, okay. <laughs> and then suddenly you start to think, oh, yeah, I write materials all the time. For all sorts of reasons. Maybe your course book isn't doing the job it should be doing. Maybe you just like writing your own materials. Um, or maybe your students come in and they want to talk about a particular topic, so you create something else. So materials writing is something that just teachers do. It's part of our job in a way. And it's very strange when people say to me, what do you do? What's your job? I never really say I'm a materials writer because to me it doesn't sound quite right because I do other things and it's all sort of part of teaching. Plus I'll tell you a story. I once went to a country, which I won't tell you the name of the country, but normally when I go to different countries, I normally say, when I go through passport control, what do you do? I either say teacher or teacher trainer, and I'm here for an educational conference, which happens. I went to one country and I thought, actually, I feel like I'm a writer today. So I went through passport <laughs> control and I had to fill in the form, what do you do? And I wrote down the word writer. I then was held in passport control for five <laughs> hours because this country was so paranoid about journalists and what they were reporting on the country. I never said writer ever again <laughs> when I went through airports. So I don't do it. I just say teacher or teacher trainer. Um, but no one ever tells you how to then become a writer or when you become a materials writer. Um, and I kind of thought about this, and I think there are kind of three stages, and it's not necessary that you go through all three stages, but it does affect the way you write materials. There's the kind of stage that all teachers have, there's writing for you and your own students. When you write those kinds of materials, you probably write things and you think, I wrote a piece of material today, worked really well for me and my students in my localised context. So if I work here, I wrote something that worked really well. And teachers do that all the time. We, we, make, we write material, we know it can work for us. 
there's a step, the next sort of step is when you start having to write for other people within your own school or institution. So you might have written a nice piece of material and then you hand it to another teacher and you may have had this experience where you've written something you think works really well. The other teacher comes into the teacher's room and says, I haven't got a lesson today. And you think, oh, it's okay, I did this really nice lesson, here's my material. And you hand it to that teacher and then you see them the next day say, how did that material go? And they go, yeah, it was okay. And you know that it didn't work for them because it wasn't you teaching that material. And what you have to learn are those techniques to write material that will work for someone else. And that's quite a different kind of skill. Um, and again, it's not something we're trained to do. It's something we slowly, that slow, we slowly learn to do. But if you, as soon as you start getting a position in a school where you're asked to produce material for other teachers, your materials have to change slightly. And there are certain basic principles associated with it. And then beyond that, you decide if you want to start trying to get published, you might try to self-publish. Amazon will give you 70% of the royalties. Very good deal. I know some people who've self-published very niche titles. They're making some good money because Amazon gives them 70%. Amazon takes 30%. It is possible, but there's not a lot of people doing it. Or you might go to a publisher and they might ask you to write a teacher's book, a workbook, some online worksheets, that kind of thing. And again, it's a very different type of writing because you're writing for an unknown audience. You're writing for teachers you may never see or you don't necessarily know the context. It's a very strange situation. And it raises all those issues that Simon was addressing because you're producing course books that may be used in countries where certain topics might not be deemed uh, appropriate. But what I'd like to touch on this evening is some of those basic principles that will help you turn your materials into materials that other teachers might use. Um, the first thing to know is that like all types of texts, for example, you teach students how to write essays, stories, letters, they are text types and they have discourse features, yeah, if you teach writing skills. The same is true if you write ELT materials. And it's easier just to embrace this and accept the fact it exists. So if we imagine you have materials, the teacher, the learner, that's basically the relationship. You've quickly got to recognise who you're writing for. And there are essentially three main types of materials. If we think about the relationship between the teacher and the learner, material isn't necessarily involved. It might be dialogue or whatever's happening in the classroom. When you're writing material for learners and the teacher's not involved, you're basically writing self-study material. You're writing workbooks, online materials, that kind of thing. And it's a particular text type and the learner has to operate without a teacher involved. For example, Duolingo, anything app there, that kind of material. You don't need the teacher. It's designed for self-study. Then there's the type of material, in-class materials. That would be a course book which involves the teacher mediating the material with the learner, and that affects how it's written. And also what's going to happen with that material. There's a different dynamic that goes on with that material, so it has to be changed the way you write it. There's a third type, um, which are, for example, materials for teachers, which obviously is a different type of writing. You're not adjusting it for the level quite so much. There's a different way of writing. Um, if you're writing an article for a journal like English Teaching Professional, you're writing directly for teachers, and it requires a certain type of writing. Normally this isn't so much of a problem, but what I often see, because I'm, I'm also involved in editing, so teachers send material to me, which I have to decide whether we could publish or whether it can be edited. Quite often we're looking for material that's in-class material to be mediated by a teacher with the learners, but what I actually receive is self-study material, and it's material actually that is more like a workbook or something like that rather than material that work in the classroom. 
and you quickly have to learn with when you're writing this different material to adjust it, particularly if you're producing material for other teachers. Let me give you an example. Here's an exercise on indirect questions, yeah? And the question, the words are jumbled up. Sort of exercise you might use in class if you've been teaching indirect questions. So the students look at the sentences, have to rearrange the words. Uh, do you know what time the lesson ends, for example, they'll come up with that. Or can you tell me the time? I'd like to know what our homework is. I was wondering if you have a spare pen. Those kinds of phrases. And it's just, it's form checking. It's checking that students understand the word order of indirect questions. If we were taking that exercise for those three different text types, for the self-study context, the, ins the rubric or the direction line, the instruction might be write the words in the correct order. For example, do you know what time the lesson is? Now, the student can do that on their own. They read that and then they know what to do. And that would go in a workbook. You'll have all seen it and you'll have set it for homework probably. But quite often teachers also write that type of exercise for in-class use, but it's not the same thing. Uh, if I was do it using this exercise in the course book, I would change the instruction line to work in pairs, put the words in the correct order, then ask uh, each other the indirect question. And the key thing is that you're introducing heads up activities because self-study materials is all about students' heads down or heads looking at a screen these days. In-class material is about a mixture of heads up, heads down. But quite often, teachers, uh, new materials writers don't integrate that into their writing. And constantly you're thinking, how is this working in the classroom? I, I spend a lot of time visualizing how the teacher will use the material and thinking, are the students heads up or heads down? Quite a lot. If I'm writing for a teacher's book, then you get this kind of paragraph. I'll just let you read it and you'll recognize it, the sort of thing that you'd read in a teacher's guide. So my instructions in the teacher's book for this activity, what am I, what's the teacher going to do before the activity starts? What's going to be going on while the students are doing the activity? And then what would be some options with the exercise after it's finished or with other students? And teacher's guides follow these patterns all the time. They use a lot of sequence of phrases like firstly, secondly. They use a lot of imperatives. They use quite a lot of modal verbs, maybe, or hedging type language. But if you start to recognize this, this is what I call the kind of lower order thinking of materials writing. It's not the stuff you should spend too much time thinking about, but the sooner as you recognize it, the more time you'll have for the creative thinking and the kind of interesting stuff that goes on in materials writing, particularly if you're trying to write stuff for other people to use. So when you start looking at course books, teachers' notes, notice how they're structured. They're structured uh, in a certain way for certain reasons. I'm going to stop talking now and give you an exercise to do. No one ever tells you that there are basic principles, and if you learn the basic principles of material writing, you will save yourself a lot of time and give yourself more time for making your materials interesting and engaging and creative. Uh, the context I've taken, I've got a worksheet that a teacher in Oxford uh, wrote. So I was saying that we work with refugees, low paid workers in my classes in Oxford. So a teacher put together uh, a worksheet that she used with the students to help the students talk about Oxford and giving directions about Oxford. She made these materials for herself, but then we wanted to develop materials that could be used by other teachers. So the first step, because you're going to see a second draft of this as well, I'm going to give you this worksheet that she made. And for five minutes, talk to the people next to you if you were the teacher who, was, who received this from the teacher who made it, what would be your reaction? What would you perhaps tell the teacher to work on and improve if you're going to use it? Okay, it has some basic principle issues. Okay, here we go. Be nice, okay? <laughs> but there are some issues, okay? Take one and pass them around. Actually, okay. 
People are really ripping this apart. <laughs> Bear in mind, she wrote it for her own lessons. So when it's a, well, there's no lead-in, well, maybe she did a lead-in that isn't on the page, in fairness, okay? But what we want to do is take this material so I can hand it to another teacher and say, well, can you go and teach the lesson on citizen games? I gave her some feedback. Here's stage two. Okay. Ah, Take a look, I'm going to give you stage two, a few minutes with the people you've been talking with, see if it addresses your issues and see what you think my feedback was on it that pushed her in this direction, okay? Just have a little, it's like compare the pictures type of activity, okay? Take, take to the first draft and just pick out a few issues and you'll have already noticed a lot of these things. First of all, the title uh, I picked up. In order to, a, a title is there so that to some extent the student knows what the topic of the lesson is, but also if you have worksheets, you photocopy them, students shove them down the bottom of their bag, two weeks later they pull them out or you say there's a test coming up and they find this piece of paper and they need to think, oh, what was that lesson? And they're pulling the bits of paper out and it has the title and it sets the scene. There's also, if you spend hours making materials, you want them to be, to, to last and be used in different contexts. So to change it to in the city makes it more generic. I can use it in more cities than just Oxford. It depends on your context. Um, the lead-in, somebody said over here there's no lead-in. I instantly look at, well, where's the lead-in? Why isn't there a question or something or an image or something to engage? We need that. We're human. Mm. We want to engage the students, and you all picked up on that. Referencing, this is basic principles, and loads of you will have looked at it and said, really? Didn't she put numbers and letters so that people can match? and so? But it happened. I see materials like this all the time without numbers. And it's basically a basic classroom management principle. It's easier to say to the student, what's the answer to number one, and get the answer quickly, rather than spend time trying to work out which word the students put. There are some exercises you just want to be able to manage, and that's why numbering and letters is there sometimes. Um, so in this case, it's, and it's hard to manage, and you end up with students and lots of lines, and it's difficult to control. There's no transition. The flow of this lesson Maybe it worked in the teacher's lesson, but if I pick it up, I want to know what is the transition from there to there. There doesn't seem to be a connection between that language and this language. The other thing that's happening is there's no heads up. It's all heads down. Now we're going to go to the next exercise. Now we're going to go to the next exercise. I'm thinking, crikey, did we get a chance to talk about something or you know, react or you know, be human? So transitions. Level of the task. No human being can listen and write, the, I don't care how good their English is, they will not fill all of those gaps. It's gap crazy. And I, you see this a lot, sort of at early level stages of teaching. Teachers learn there's something called gap fills and they go gap fill mad for a while and you have to kind of get it down and think, can you do that exercise <laughs> you know, physically? So. But this happens, I see this, plus the gaps aren't numbered so you can't manage it. There's those basic principles. Consistency, there's not consistency of numbering. And there's certain things in materials that just should be consistent because you don't want to waste time on this in class. So find the reason rubrics often repeat themselves in course books is because they need to be simple and you don't want to spend time explaining the rubric. 
But it is interesting how many course books you pick up and you spend more time explaining the instruction in the book than actually doing the exercise. Or sometimes your students get so used to it they just jump straight onto the gap fill and they won't spend time trying to understand the instruction because it's too complicated. But the task is clear. And there's also that thing of adding examples. If you give number one, as we know, teachers give them examples, students know what they normally have to do. Um, I like headings in materials. You might disagree, but you'll see that she started putting in headings. For me, headings are like signposts through the lesson. They also highlight the aim of different parts of the lesson. You sometimes see materials now with little menus at the beginning, but actually putting headings like little sub, it's like reading just an article. If it's, got, if it's broken up with headings, it actually has become, it's easier to work your way through it. It's like looking at a cookery book or a recipe book. It just helps. It's a particular personal thing, but I think it helps the navigation. And if I look at the material, I can see what is the aim of that section and it helps me as a teacher to know where I'm steering the class. So she's added those in. Um, context, again, I want to broaden the context away from Oxford uh, and make it more um, generalised. And a key thing here is rubrics, which people often find quite hard to write. But whenever you see a rubric that's that long with no full stops or not broken down, I start to worry. If you see rubrics with relative clauses in, then you know you've probably got a problem. Rubrics don't need to be complicated language. You can usually put a conjunction in like and, but normally you want to break them down into about two clear sentences, more or less. And if you've got an instruction like work in pairs, just be consistent with that type of language, because you don't want people to spend too much time on it. But actually writing rubrics is, is all about just pitching it low all the time. Even on advanced materials, keep it at sort of elementary level, because it's just getting you to the next thing. It's not to, supposed to hold the students up. So you end up with this kind of thing with the headings. We get a lead in, we get an example, so the students know what they have to do without reading it. The key thing is we get visuals, because it's crying out for a, a map or a picture or something and all visuals that we all material we give to students will be so much better if it has visuals with it if you're teaching eap classes who will have to read text without images sometimes that's slightly different but in general we live in a visual world so include images um, language reference boxes this kind of thing's really useful because, again, the student might look back at this in two weeks, think, what was that lesson about? This is the target language. It's a, like a little reference for them to go back to, so it's quite nice if you feature it in some way. And again, we, we limit the gap fills, and then we get onto the speaking, which is much more scaffolded in, in that um, text. If you were going to give this person more feedback here, what other things did you think, oh, I'd, I'd quite like to change that as well at draft two. If she was going to write a third draft, what do you think you might do with the lesson? Uh, I think she's probably a little bit too much target language. Too much target language? Okay. Uh, she would be writing it for elementary to pre-intermediate because they're very mixed ability classes. Yeah. Yeah. Use the same font. Same font because she used two different fonts. It's it's New Roman. Right. And okay. Uh, so little design things, and we expect things to be better designed than computers. Yeah. What we actually did next was we went out into Oxford with a video camera and we went up to people in the street and said, "Can you tell me the way to?" So, and we just made authentic video, and actually that was far better material than that because we got all sorts of language coming out and coming to the issue of diversity we went down the Cowley Road if you know Oxford it's the most culturally diverse road there is you think of Oxford University buildings white middle-class students you go down the Cowley Road there's every nationality there you stop them and say can you tell me the way to the post office you just get tons of interesting language 
uh, it's, it's a really great, and video is so easy to make now that that's actually far more generative to target if students are living in Oxford, suddenly they're exposed to all sorts of accents. So that for me is kind of more the way to go and I'm trying to get more and more of that authentic video in my material now because it's, it's a real richness to it. Just to sum up then, some basic principles, and again, this isn't the creative stuff, this is the stuff to make your material easy to use, and it's like routines. I do it every day when I'm writing, but if you know the routines, it's easier. Titles and subheadings, basic principles, it's really useful just to have them in there because it's a navigation around the material. Visuals, any authentic bits you can add to it. The map from Oxford is fine, although it does contain some vocabulary which that material doesn't deal with. But it does lift the page and suddenly it gives it a sense of authenticity. The students can see the point of the lesson uh, all of a sudden. This is basic stuff, numbering, good instructions, examples, that kind of thing. But people miss it out all the time. But if you're going to give the material to someone else, it has to be in there. And it just becomes a routine. The rule of eight is not grounded in any type of theory, but when I write gap fills, I generally use eight because I've tried six and it always feels a bit not enough. If I have 10 or 12, it always drags on too long in class. If I'm writing workbook material, then I probably maybe have more than eight gaps or eight questions. But this just sort of seems to work, and it's based on no theory of second language acquisition <laughs> whatsoever. It's just how I feel about it, okay? It seems to be something that works. Transitions and flow. If you've got one exercise with head down, another with heads down, you need, that, you need to break it up. Personalization, that last activity with the role plays is student giving directions based on where they are and their lives. If you put personalization activities at the end of any lesson, it really makes a good focus for the material. Quite often I'll think of the personalization task at the end of the lesson and almost plan backwards. And it works well in lesson planning as well as backward planning, thinking how can I bring it back to the student at the end. And then variety of heads up and heads down. I keep talking about materials being heads up and heads down. And it's a great way to visualize the material you write, particularly for in-class material. Mentally, in my head, I have this kind of diagram. And when I do teacher training, I give it to teachers to a, as an observation task. Or I say, look at your lesson plan and do a heads up, heads down analysis. Really, this is how it works. So this is the length of your lesson, 45 minutes, 60 minutes. In that lesson, you will have a series of stages and activities. Sometimes the students' heads will be up, looking at you, talking to each other, etc. Sometimes they'll be down in the material. And any class would normally have a combination of both. If I observe a lesson and I observe this going on, the likelihood is I'm going to have motivation problems because the students are heads down the whole time and they're going to get bored, or potentially. It depends. If it was a writing lesson or something, it might be a bit more like that with a little bit of discussion at the back. But with that worksheet, if you analyse her worksheet and you look at each exercise, you'll see that it has that pattern. It starts with a lead-in, they study some vocabulary, they have a conversation about the map, they do some listening, then they do a control practice role play and they finish with a free practice role play. Now if I see that kind of pattern with the material or even with a lesson plan or a lesson, I know that I'm getting a good balance of heads up and heads down. If I'm writing material and exercise one, two and three have all been down here, I think, crikey, I need to get something in there because I'm, this material isn't going to work. And the problem with material on the page, by nature, it's heads down. And the job of the materials writer is to help the teacher get the heads up. So you have to build in that sort of activity. Um, and it's, it's tricky to do. But mentally, you can analyze the course books you use using this kind of uh, approach. And it's very interesting to see. You'll see 
books that claim to be course books, they're actually more like workbooks, which are basically heads down the whole time. So it's just an analytical tool. And if a teacher is having problems, you're observing a teacher and they're having problems with motivation and interest, get them to do a little heads up, heads down analysis of their lesson. Lindsay Clanfield, who I wrote a book with, take it, took this one step further. He said, yeah, that's fine, but what about screens nowadays? If we have interactive whiteboards and video, that's technically it's heads up, but it's actually heads down because students are just watching screens these days, like interactive. What if the teacher isn't... So he's taken it a step further. He has heads down in the book, heads up looking at the screen, and heads together so he's added a third dimension and you analyze your lesson plan that way when the students have got their heads together and talking. And it's a really interesting analytical tool if you have an interactive whiteboard in the classroom. So something to play around with, but it's a useful tool for materials writing as well. Okay, uh, we knew that. You need to develop your materials radar. Um, Simon obviously had his materials radar going around London, picking newspapers, images, all of that. It's something you just kind of develop, particularly if you like writing materials. I'm showing you Harold Pinter because Pinter's technique when he wrote all his wonderful plays, he spent hours on the top of London buses just listening to people's conversations and writing down things that they said to each other and snippets of conversation and then put them into plays. And if, for example, you're writing uh, your own audio scripts or you want to listen to how people really use language, I am the most nosy person. I will get close to conversations going on because I love to pick out maybe functional language that they're using, just anything. This is why video is so good. If you just video people in the street, you suddenly hear real language and you can pick out functional language and you can integrate it into materials. Um, it means that I never read newspapers with a real purpose anymore. It's always about, is that article going to work in a classroom? Can I turn that into a piece? It's a really sad existence I have, okay? But that's, you become obsessive about it. Your material radar's on all the time. Uh, I once had to write a unit on sport, and I must have written, I don't know, four or five units on sport in course books, and I just wanted a fresh angle. I came across some quotes on winning and losing by famous sports people, and my material radar went crazy because of the grammar point that was jumping out at me. What was it? The grammar, it's just full of gerunds. Gerunds are subject, gerunds after prepositions, gerunds after verbs of like. It was like, oh, gosh, this was just written for me. I don't have to change it, it's authentic language. You can't imagine the sad pleasure that gave me when I discovered it and my material. And so I shoved it into a unit and we looked at verb plus ing forms. When you find that kind of language, it just, you've got to get it in class. It's like finding the right kind of picture. Um, I came across this picture. I write for National Geographic Learning and I have access to their bank of images and I love this one when I found it because it wasn't in colour, it wasn't some dull explorer at the top of a mountain. It was just three ordinary people but the photo is so generative. Um, what do you think the topic was of the unit that I used it with? Different possibilities? Huh? Could have been technology, generations, communication, huh? gossip, women, gender, all sorts of... The test of a really good photograph for materials writers is can I use it in five or six different ways, different topics? Does it just... I look at the picture and it just asks me questions straight away and that's how I t test the good picture. And also, can I use it for lower order and higher order thinking? For example, I can have students describe it, discuss the age of the women and so on. That's lower order descriptive language. But I could also say to students, I put them into groups of three and say, two of you are these two women, write the dialogue you're having. The third person, you're listening to a conversation, what are you texting to your friend about their conversation? and they write and then they compare their text and the dialogue and suddenly it's a higher order creative thinking skill. And if I can do those different things with an image like that, 
that's very satisfying. Uh, if you like using images in class, I'm sure you've got lots of sources. My own personal favourites are Unsplash, which does beautiful photos and they're all free to use. You have permission to use them. The photographer likes to be sourced, but you don't have to. So it has a Creative Commons license. Nice classroom stuff. Pixabay, Comp Fight is another. National Geographic has a site called Your Shot where people submit their own images and you just type in the word and it will throw you up hundreds of different images. And quite often if you want to use them and you want to get permission, you can email the person who took the photograph. They are so happy that you want to reuse their image as long as you give them reference and say who took it kind of thing. Um, and then more and more, I just take my own rather than deal with the whole copyright thing. If I see something interesting, I take it on my phone and then I integrate it into my everyday teaching materials. They don't let me put it in the course books, but, but for my own materials, just take your own images. It's a lot easier. Um, so the materials radio are with, with images for listening, for reading, for looking at text. It's important to develop it. And I over the years have created lists. So for using images, I've just started to make lists and lists of generic questions I can use with any type of image. So questions for description, describing people, describing activities. Imagine you're in the picture type activities, personalization, comparing, predicting, reusing the image in different ways. And I just build up a bank of images so that I'm constantly, rather than having to reinvent the wheel every time, I've just got my reference list. Um, which I've done over a long period of time, um, and to save people like you constantly having to come up with these, a uh, couple of resources. I was part of the Materials Writing Special Interest Group, and we set up a place called Resources, and we've just included loads of links to help people write their own materials. It's free to use, you don't have to be a member, but if you go to that site, you'll find all sorts of links. Some of the most useful ones are the links that allow you to analyze text for level. So it gives you links to places like Text Inspector, an English vocabulary profile, where you cut and paste the text, put it into the online tool and it will tell you the level of the text, the levels of the words. It's really helpful when you're adapting text or trying to judge the level. So that's one site. If you want to use a lot of my checklists, I've got a book called Etpedia Materials Writing, which was on display over there. It's basically 50 units of lists. So you will find 10 types of listening comprehension question to write. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, 10 types of sentence transformation questions. If you have to write those kinds of questions, it will tell you how to do it. Um, 10 types of gap fill exercise. Maybe you're bored with always writing the same gap fill exercise. It gives you it as a reference for all the other types of gap fills. 10 types of questions. Uh, 10 ways to write video exercises, and it's just sort of summarized uh, in a quick reference list, basically. Um, it's from Pavilion Publications, and we have a series of books in the ETpedia series on all sorts of different topics. Technology, vocabulary is coming out soon. ELT management's coming out soon. Uh, we have one on grammar, so it's 50 different types of grammar, and then 10 ideas for teaching each grammar point. So the whole selection... If you're interested in this one, you can get 20% discount if you put that code in, if you buy it online, MW20, for example. Um, this other book I worked on, I think you had Sue Kay here recently, who's involved in an organization called EL Teacher to Writer. They publish a variety of books for materials writers, but this is a compendium, and my chapter on writing audio and video scripts is in it, and again, They'll give you 20% using VM35E on there. But this is a sort of self-published thing. If you're interested in self-publishing, that's basically what they've done. They've set it up um, like that. So those kinds of reference books will help you with the sort of basic principles of materials writing so you can spend more time on the interesting 
uh, creative stuff. Uh, my website's John Hughes ELT. My email is john at hugheselt.com. Uh, I can see we're running out of time for questions and so on, but if you wanted to email me, ask me any questions from tonight, that's absolutely fine, okay? We've got a couple of minutes. Any questions anybody wanted to raise about topic of materials writing? Go on. Yeah, so as a, as a writer in the published uh, materials, um, how much um, do you take into consideration like uh, a low level newly qualified teacher? Because you were talking about heads up and heads down things, but some of that responsibility is part of the teacher. Uh, it is, but I think a lot of teacher training probably happens through course books, so I'm aware of the responsibility of that. Plus, I think teachers' books that go with course books have just got better and better over the years, so they will help new teachers. But when I'm writing a course book I'm writing, I always say I'm writing for three types of teachers. There's one teacher who will start at exercise one on the page, go to two, go to three, go to four, go to four, finish at ten. Very, I've met really effective teachers who do everything in the course book. They don't bring anything from outside. Their students love them. They get great feedback. They produce really good language speakers. They just work with the course material. There's a second type of teacher that regards the course book more like a, a framework to follow. They'll start at exercise one, go to exercise three, do exercise four, go back to two, jump over to seven, maybe get to ten, or just they've written something else and they go and do something else. And then there's the teacher who uses it like a springboard. They look at the text, think, that's a great text, but those comprehension questions are rubbish. I would never do those. And they go off and do their own thing with that bit of the course book. I've observed teachers teach from my course book, and I haven't recognized my own material because they've photocopied it, cut it up, stuck it on the wall, the whole shebang. And I'm right, I'm aware that I'm writing for all three types, but my primary responsibility is the teacher who starts at one, goes through all the exercise, finishes at ten. Because if I can get it right for that teacher, the other two teachers will sort of take care of themselves to some extent. I mean, the material's got to be motivating and so on, but that's, and that's quite often the new teacher who needs that kind of hand-holding. But not only, I mean, there's plenty of experienced teachers who stick to the book, yeah. But you're writing, when I'm in my head thinking who am I writing for, to some extent I'm writing for that sort of teacher first of all. And then I'm adding extra activities, photocopies and so on for those other teachers who want to do other stuff with it. Yeah. How open are publishers to people who don't have a name or reputation in the materials writing? Uh, they are, they like it, they like trying to bring in new people all the time and uh, also because people like me get older and we get sort of in to our routines and that sort of thing and we write a certain sort of book and new challenges come up like the whole issue of diversity. Publishers are trying to get that in and they're looking for people to write that but it's a tricky balancing. I tend to think it'll be localised publishing a lot of it, like you'd write books for a London type of course. Um, but you have to, I got into it by writing reports on other people's books. So I lived in Italy, I did a lot of business English, Oxford University Press uh, brought us business English materials. I wrote reports for them, which they're always looking for readers, teachers to try stuff out, give feedback. And I just went that bit. I said, well, I like this. I don't like that. What the writer should do is do this. And why don't you add that activity there and put that in the course book? And they said, oh, you've got lots of ideas. Do you want to write a teacher's book? And then so it, it's a little bit of that. And these days, profile counts for a lot, like getting to conferences, giving talks as well, because more than it ever has because of social media and so on, publishers like to see sort of a presence, but I don't think that's actually a good test of a writer necessarily, somebody who does all of that. But, but that, that's linked in with it, you have to. And it's harder and harder to send your ideas to a publisher and hope that they will publish it because they have five-year publishing plans and they do focus groups and it's a very different way of publishing than it was 20 years ago. 
Small publishers like Pavilion, who publish ETpedia, or who publish English magazine, teaching magazine. I mean, I started when I started writing. I sent my ideas to ETP because it's been going for I don't know 30 years now. And the editor's great. She will send you feedback, and she will teach you how to write an article that people can understand and read. And they include photocopyables and things. So getting public, and they will pay you a little bit of money, 50, 60 quid. And you get your name, you get proper feedback from an editor. It's a nice way to get going. Nice to see yourself in print. And you're developing your writing skills because you're getting that kind of feedback. So that's a good way um, to start in a way because you have to go through the editor. Uh, lots of people set up their own blogs. The only reservation I have about that is you don't have the gatekeeper. You're writing it, but you don't have an editor who's asking the right questions and editors are essential for good materials. But this, this kind of thing is a good way to, if you've got an idea, take a little bit of it, publish it in here, try it out and then expand on it. Yeah. Any other questions or should we stop, Simon? If you, if you, okay, thank you. But if any of you have questions, just drop me an email if it's a question about anything related to it. Okay.